Hello! It's time for Chapter 10 of Ruby Fruit Jungle. Gainesville, Florida is the bedpan of the South. Positioned in north-central Florida, it has scrub pines, Spanish moss, and blood clots of brick institutional buildings. It's the home of the University of Florida. The only reason I went there was because they gave me a full scholarship plus room and board. Duke, Vassar, and Radcliffe offered smaller packages, and having no money, my choice was determined by material consideration. Carrie and Florence put me on the Greyhound bus, which pulled up behind the Howard Johnsons, and took off to pull up behind another Howard Johnson throughout the state. The bus ride took 12 hours, but finally I arrived and took my first look at the dismal town. With my one suitcase sporting a girl state sticker firmly in hand, I walked to the dorm. The university placed me in Broward Hall, known on campus as the Bay of Pigs, but it was free, so I endured it. On that first day, I discovered my roommate, a pre-med from Jacksonville, Faye Rader. Since I had scribbled pre-law on my entrance forms, the administration probably thought it would be a good match. It was, but not for reasons of studiousness. Faye and I discovered a common bond for disruption, and we lost no time in establishing a system of payoffs to the building guards so we could get in and out of the basement windows after the dorm doors had been locked to protect our virginity from the night air. <coughs> Faye pledged Chai Omega because her mother was a Chayo back in 1941, and I pledged Delta 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 because they, like the university, promised to pay for everything. Dirty rush. Faye said she pledged a sorority to please her mother, whose only joy in life was the Jacksonville Alumni Association, and I pledged because campus politics demanded it. This way, all my election costs would be footed jointly by the sorority and the party to which the sorority belonged, University Party. I ran for freshman representative and won. Bay was campaign manager, which Tri-Delta considered a stroke of political brilliance because it helped unite the houses of Tri-Delta and Chi Omega, who together dominated the remaining 11 sororities on campus. Bay and I laughed at the solemnity with which all this was greeted by our sisters and spent our free hours together crossing the camp county line for liquor, bringing it back to the dorm, watering it slightly, and selling it at a higher price. We both hated the university with its dull agricultural majors, grim business majors, and all the girls running around in trench coats with art history tucked under their left armpits. Faye confessed she didn't really care about being a doctor, but she'd be damned if she'd sit in humanities courses with all those bubbling girls who wore circle pins on their round collars. Her father bought her a 100 a 190 SL Mercedes to encourage her to study, and he had a habit of sending fat checks in the mail every two weeks. Bay was the spirit of generosity, maybe, because she didn't know what money was worth, but I loved her for it, whatever her motive. She cast one glance at my tiny wardrobe and marched me off to the best store in town and blew $300 on clothes. To spare my pride, she announced she wasn't going to be seen with a roomie who wore the same shirt every other day. I think I was a curiosity of Bay. She couldn't fathom my ambition, but then Bay couldn't fathom poverty. It was against the rules, of course, but Fay had a tiny icebox hidden in her closet where she kept mixers, olives, and cream cheese. She hid the liquor in shoeboxes. I didn't figure out that Fay was on her way to becoming a late adolescent alcoholic until the middle of October. I asked her why she drank so much, but she told me not to get moral on her, so I dropped it. Her grades began to sink, and she cut classes more and more frequently. Luckily for me, I never needed to study much to get my grades, because Faye would have no part of studying for herself or anybody else. At 9 o'clock each night, if we were still in the dorm, Faye would run out in the hall with a huge cowbell, beat on it with a drumstick, and yell, Study, study, all you brown nosers. Then she'd sail back in her room and have another drink. Chai Omega worried about their new pledge when Faye showed up at the dinner for President Reich and veered up to him, rumbling, Hey, uh, Prez, how you hanging? In an effort to steer her toward the paths of righteousness, she had to have an hour-long heart-to-heart -heart with her big sister, Kathy, once a week. Faye fumed that it was lay psychiatry and offended her new-sprung professional ethics. One Thursday after a session, she came back to our room and slammed the door. Bolt, I blew it. I just fucking blew it. I told my goddamn big sister shit that I'm pregnant and need an abortion. Her milk-white face curdled right in front of me. She promised not to tell anyone, but I bet dollars to donuts she opens her yap. Oh, my mother be pissed. Are you sure you're pregnant? Yes, I'm goddamn fucking sure. Enough to make you vomit, isn't it? Where can we get an abortion? I know a guy in med school who will do it. 
but I have to give him $500. Can you believe $500 to scrape a tiny bit of gook from my insides? Do you think he's safe? Who knows? Well, when are we doing it? Tomorrow night. You're driving me there, Cookie. Okay. Did you tell Kathy you were going tomorrow? No. At least I had sense enough not to spill that. I don't even know why I told her in the first place. It was on my mind and it popped out. Stupid. The next evening, we left the dorm at 9 and drove out west of the town. We pulled in the driveway of the med student's trailer and Faye climbed out. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. You stay here and wait. It seemed hours, and I was so nervous I threw up. The whole thing was creepy, and the Spanish moss in the night looked like ragged fingers of death coming to get me. All I could think of was Faye in there on some kitchen table with him doing God knows what. I thought maybe I should go in there, but then suppose I barge in at the critical moment and he punches a hole in her or something. Eventually, Faye wobbled out. I ran out of the car to help her. Faye are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. A little weak. As we neared the dorm, I turned out the lights and pulled into the Macadam parking lot. We walked slowly to the basement window that was permanently unlocked at the price of $10 per week to the guard. I lifted Faye through because it was high up. As I dropped to the other side, I noticed blood oozing down her leg. Faye, you're bleeding. Maybe we should go to a real doctor. No, he told me I might bleed a little. It's okay. Shut up about it or you'll make me think about it. We started up the four flights of stairs to our room, and Faye was going painfully slow. I'm so goddamn weak. This is going to take a fucking hour. Put your arms around my neck, and I'll carry you up. Molly, you crack me up. I weigh 135, and you must weigh about 100. I'm very strong. Come on, this is no time to pull Weight Watchers. Put your arms around my neck. She leaned on me, and I picked her up. My hero, she laughed. I cut classes the next two days to hang around the room in case Faye needed me. She recovered in record time, and by Saturday was ready for another liquor-sodden weekend. I'm going over to Jacksonville to raise hell. Don't be an ass white, Faye. Take it easy this weekend. If you're so worried, you can come along and play nurse. We can stay at my house and come back Sunday night. Come on. Okay, but promise me you won't pick up some stud and bust open your stitches or whatever you got up there. <laughs> you crack me up. We started out at a bar near Jacksonville University, black walls, day glow paint on them, and a huge sea turtle shell here and there. An enormous basketball player bought his drinks and insisted on asking me to dance. My nose hit his navel and I got cramps in my arches from dancing so long on my toes. We left there and headed toward the inner city. I'm going to take you to a wild bar, Molly, so gear yourself. The bar was Rosetta's, named after the owner who walked around with a black lasagna hairdo teed up teased up nearly a foot with chopsticks stuck in it at various angles. Rosetta smiled at us as we came in and demanded our IDs. They were fake, of course, but we passed Checkpoint Charlie and went over to a table in the corner. As we sat down, I glanced in the direction of the dance floor and noticed that the men were dancing with each other and the women were dancing with other women. I had a sudden urge to clap my hands in frenzied applause, but I suppressed it because I knew no one would understand. Say, how'd you find this place? I get around, toots. Are you gay? No, but I like gay bars. They're more fun than straight ones. Plus, there's no jocks to paw at you. I thought I'd bring you here for a little treat. Thought you'd shock me, right? I don't know. I just thought it'd be fun. Let's have fun, then. Come on, smartass. How'd you like to dance? Bolt, you crack me up. Who the hell is going to lead? You are, because you're taller than I am. Wonderful. I can be a butchess. Come on... Once on the terrazzo dance floor, we had a hard time keeping our balance because Faye was laughing uproariously. Every two steps, she mangled my sandaled foot. Then, in a burst of concentration, she gave me a Fred Astaire twirl and made use of her cotillion training. As the final strains of Ruby and the Romantics died down, we started for our table to be intercepted by two young women on the other side of the dance floor. Excuse me, don't you all go to Florida and live in Broward? Faye volunteered the information. Then the short one asked us if we'd come to their table for a drink. We agreed to that and trotted back to our corner table to retrieve our drinks. Molly, if that little one tries to pick me up, you tell her we're going together, okay? Instant marriage, is it? In that case, I'll do anything for my wife. Thanks, dearie. I'll do the same for you. Remember, we're the hottest couple since Adam and Eve. Wrong metaphor. Since Sappho and whoever. Come on. 
The women's names were Eunice and Dix. They were in Kappa Alpha Theta and came here on weekends under the pretense that their boyfriends lived in Jacksonville, but really to escape the prying eyes of their loving sorority sisters. Dix, the little one, was very busy cruising Faye. Faye was worth cruising. She had jet black hair and white porcelain skin that set off light hazel eyes. A southern belle gone co-ed. I was uncertain about bar etiquette. I didn't know if I was supposed to ask people to dance, buy them drinks, or even ask them about themselves, especially since people only gave me their first names. Eunice offered that she was a physical therapy major, and Dix was in English. They'd been going together for almost a year and a half. How nice, Faye drawled, and I practically strangled on my drink. Faye was singularly unimpressed with any display of romanticism, be it homosexual or a common garden-variety heterosexual. Dix and Eunice were beyond sarcasm and thought Faye had given them the blessed sign of approval. Thanks to that, we got the entire scenario of their love, how they met in math class, how long it took them to get into bed, and so forth. Dix became more animated with every drink. Soon she leaned over to confide in us. You'll never guess what happened to us when we lived in Jennings and had straight roommates. I can't wait. Do tell, they answered. Well, we usually made love in Eunice's room because her roomie had a night class. So one night I'm over there and, well, you know, I was, uh, I was going down on her. And we heard her roomie's voice coming down the hall. Honey, I didn't know whether to go blind, shit, or run for my life. Luckily, we had locked the door, so I started to pull away when my braces got caught in Eunice's hair. There was her roommate knocking on the door, bellowing, and there I was, stuck in an incriminating position. No time to be gentle, I yanked myself away. Eunice released his blood-curdling yell, and her roommate is outside, fumbling with the key in the door, screaming someone's trying to murder Eunice. I ran into the closet. Jane got the door open, and half the hall marched in after her to see the corpse. Eunice pulled the covers up over herself, sweaty and frantic, and tried to look in pain. Which she was. Jane wants to know what happened. Eunice lied that she had mistakenly locked the door when she took her nap, her back locked on her. The yell was when she tried to get up to open the door. Then the whole crew of dollies wants to carry Eunice to the infirmary. You should have seen Eunice talking herself out of that one. Oh, this thing happens every now and then. It would go away overnight. God knows how long it took her to get the room cleared out. And I had to stay in that ratty closet until her roommate went to sleep. And then I tiptoed out and got back to my own dorm after hours, so I had hell to pay for that. We laughed since it was expected of us, and I was grateful that Dix was so talkative, because if she'd asked me anything, I didn't know what I'd say. Eunice turned to Faye. How long have you two been together? Since September, when we discovered we were roommates. And you didn't know each other before school? Dix asked. No, Faye answered. It was love at first sight. Had either of you been gay before college? Eunice probed, fascinated with our storybook romance. This time I beat Faye to the punch. Faye wasn't, but I was. Faye looked at me, suppressing a giggle, thinking I had added a new twist to her fairy tale. How long did it take you to seduce her? Dix pressed on. Oh, about one week. Yeah, I was an easy lay. We stayed at the bar for another hour, exchanging information about what professor to miss, who else was gay, etc. Faye gracefully extracted us by saying we had to get up early in the morning to go shopping with her mother. On the way home, Faye was in hysterics over who was gay in the various sororities. We pulled into the driveway of an imitation colonial mansion overlooking the St. John's River. The inside of the house looked like window cases for a furniture store. Faye's mother had one room in Colonial Plush, another in Mediterranean, and another in French Provincial. Everything was color coordinated, and I expected the price tags to still be hanging from the goods. Faye's room was 17 gone raunchy. Her twin beds had matching orange bedspreads and curtains. A black shag rug wilted between the two beds, and a vanity groaned under the weight of other perfumes and other paraphernalia of female disguise. Faye took off her clothes, threw them on the floor, and flopped into the bed. I am fucking sober. Sober? Weren't those two funny? Wait until we see them at the next Panhellenic Pity Tea. That ought to be rich. Yeah, but they were sweet in a square, old-fashioned way. I suppose, but I can't stand it when people get all moony about each other. That's because you've never been in love. You haven't got a heart, Daisy. Only a pericardium. Thanks. Oh, I'm only teasing you. I can't stand all that romantic crap either, especially when they play footsie under the table. God. But everybody does it, straight or gay. It turns me off. Maybe I'm not either one. Even if I fall in love, I'm not degenerating into that doodle shit. 
Faye looked out her window over the dark river and then turned to me. Have you ever thought about doing it with a woman? Thought about it? Faye, I wasn't kidding when I told Eunice I was gay before college. Molly, you shit. All this time we've been roommates and you never told me that. And you never asked. People don't think of those things to ask. You are really a hot shit. So besides Frank at Phi Delta, you've been going out with girls? I can't believe you. You are too fucking much. No, sorry to disappoint you, but I haven't been dating anyone but Frank the fullback. Well, I am pissed you didn't tell me. Here we go through my abortion. I tell you everything, and you don't tell me this one thing about yourself? Come to think of it, you don't talk about yourself much anyway. What other secrets are you hiding, Mata Harry? Faye, it's not like this big thing that I keep locked up inside. There wasn't any reason to tell you. Besides, my mind is occupied with a lot of other things and the fact that I've slept with some girls. You're a hot shit. I know you slept with men, but women? I'm truly impressed. Why don't you shut up so I can go to sleep? Faye collapsed on her bed with a huffed noise. I beat my pillow so part of it would be flat. I can't stand overweight pillows. Molly? What? God damn it. Let's fuck. Faye, you crack me up. That's my line and I'm serious. Come on. No, period. Why not? It's a long story. My experiences with non-lesbians who want to sleep with me have been gross. How can you be a non-lesbian and sleep with another woman? Beats me, but the last girl I slept with had it all figured out in her twisted brain. Now that I'm dying of curiosity and insulted by your refusal, you'd better tell me about these non-lesbians before I swallow my tongue and turn purple in the face. If you don't, I'll scream and tell Mother you tried to rape me. Faye faked a noiseless scream. I immediately told her my tale of woe. That was a raw deal. After that, I'd go celibate. I did. Break it. Come over here and sleep with me. I promise not to be a non-lesbian. Your sense of humor overwhelms me. Faye jumped out of bed, threw the covers off me, and declared, If you won't come over to me, I'll come over to you. Now I am goddamn fucking serious. Move your ass over. She plopped down next to me. Now what do I do? I never did this before. Faye, I can see this is going to be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. You and Humphrey Bogart. Molly, I do want to make love. She hugged me and gave me a kiss on the forehead. Okay, so maybe part of it is curiosity, but another part of it is that I have more fun with you than anyone else in the whole fucking world. I probably love you more than anybody. This is the way it should be, you know? A lover who is a friend and not that moony crap. She gave me a long, soft kiss. She was serious. In times like this, intellectual analysis does no damn good, and I swept away thoughts of the aftermath and kissed her neck, her shoulders, and returned to her mouth. The rest of that semester we spent in bed, emerging only to go to class and to eat. Faye made her grades because it was the only way we could be together, and she stopped drinking because she found something that was more fun. Shy Omega began to think Faye had died and gone to heaven. Tri Delta resorted to sending me urgent notices in the mail. We were 18, in love, and didn't know the world existed, but it knew we existed. Not until February did I notice that people on our hall weren't speaking to us anymore. Conversations stopped when one or both of us would amble down the brown halls. They concluded they all had chronic laryngitis and decided she'd cure it. She hooked up a Mickey Mouse Club record to the ugly brick bell tower that rang class changes. Then she announced to our dorm neighbors that at 3.30 the true nature of the university would be revealed via the bell tower. As soon as the record blared across the campus, Dot and Karen ran in front next door to giggle at Faye's success. Just as quickly, they turned on their heels to walk out when Faye bluntly asked, How come you two don't talk to us anymore? Terror crossed Dot's face, and she told the half-truth. Because you stay in your room all the time. Bullshit, Faye countered. There's got to be another reason, I added. Karen, angered at our bad manners and being so direct, spat at us gracefully. You two are together so much, it looks like you're lesbians. I thought Faye was going to heave her chemistry book at Karen. Her white face was so red. I looked Karen right in the face and said calmly, We are. Karen reeled back as though she was slapped with a soggy dish rag. 
you're sick. You don't belong in a place like this with all these girls around. Faye was now on her feet, moving toward Karen, and Dot, the picture of courage, was at the door fumbling with the knob. Faye shifted into overdrive and roared her engine. Why, Karen, are you afraid I might sleep with you? Are you afraid I might sneak over in the middle of the night and attack you? Faye was laughing by this time, and Karen was petrified. Karen, if you were the last woman on Earth, I'd go back to men. You're a simpering, pimply-faced cretin. Karen ran out the room, and Faye howled. Did you see her face? What an insipid asswipe that creature is. Faye, we're in for it now. She's going to run right to the resident council, and we're going to be in real fucking trouble. They'll probably throw us out. Let them. Who the hell wants to rot in this institution of miseducation? I do. It's my one chance to get out of the boondocks. I've got to get my degree. We'll go to a private school. You can go to a private school. I can't even pay for my own food, goddammit. Look, my old man will pay your way. We can work part-time to pay your way. Shit, I wish he'd give you the money. I don't give a rat's ass about my degree. But that's out of the question. Anyway, he wants me to stay in school, so he'll send bonuses to encourage me, and we can get along with that, plus a little work. I think it's going to be harder than that, Faye, but I hope you're right. One half hour after Faye insulted Karen's non-existent sexuality, she was called to the resident counselor's office while I was sent to the dean of women, Miss Marne. This creature was a heifer-like, red-haired woman who had been a major in the Army Corps back in World War II. She liked to quote her military experiences as proof that women could make it. I walked into her house and garden office with all the painted plaques on the wall. She probably had one up there as proof of her femininity, too. She smiled broadly and shook my hand vigorously. Sit down, won't you, Miss Bolt? Have a cigarette? No, thank you. I don't smoke. Lies of you. Now let's get down to business. I called you here because of the unfortunate incident in your dormitory. Would you care to explain that to me? No. Miss Bolt, this is a very serious matter, and I want to help you. It will be much easier if you cooperate. She ran her hand over the glass cover of her maplewood desk and smiled reassuringly. Molly, may I call you that? I nodded. What the hell do I care what she called me? I've been going over your record, and you're one of our most outstanding students. An honor scholar, tennis team, freshman representative, tribe delta. You're a go-getter, as we say. <laughs> I think you're the kind of young woman who will want to work out this problem that you have, and I want to help you work it out. A person like you could go far in this world. She lowered her voice confidentially. I know what's been hard for you, your birth, and, well, you simply didn't have the advantages of other girls. That's why I admire the way you've risen above your circumstances. Now tell me about this difficulty you have in relating to girls and your roommate. Dean Marne, I don't have any problem relating to girls, and I'm in love with my roommate. She makes me happy. Her scraggly red eyebrows with the brown pencil glaring through shot up. Is this relationship with Faye Raider of an uh, intimate nature? We fuck if that's what you're after. I think her womb collapsed on that one. Sputtering, she pressed forward. Don't you find that somewhat of an aberration? Doesn't this disturb you, my dear? After all, it's not normal. I know it's not normal for people in this world to be happy, and I'm happy. Hmm. Perhaps there are things hidden in your past, secrets in your unconscious that keep you from having a healthy relationship with members of the opposite sex. I think with some hard work on your part and professional assistance, you can uncover these blocks and find a way to a deeper, more meaningful relationship with a man. She took a breath and smiled that administrative smile. Haven't you ever thought about children, Molly? No. This time she couldn't hide her shock. I see. Well, dear, I have arranged for you to see one of our psychiatrists here three times a week, and of course, you'll see me once a week. I want you to know I'm in there rooting for you to get through this phase you're in. I want you to know I'm your friend. If I had had a blowtorch, I'd have turned it on her smiling face until it was as red as her hair. I didn't have one in my purse, so I did the next best thing. Dean Marne, why are you pushing me so hard to be a mother and all that rot when you aren't even married? She squirmed in her seat and avoided my gaze. I had broken the code and put her on the spot. We're here to discuss you, not me. I had plenty of opportunities. 
I decided a career was more important to me than being a homemaker. Many ambitious women were forced into that choice in my day. You know what I think? I think you're as much a lesbian as I am. You're a goddamn fucking closet fairy, that's what you are. I know you've been living with no styles of the English department for the last 15 years. You're running this whole number on me to make yourself look good. Hell, at least I'm honest about what I am. Yes, her face was red, inflamed. She slammed her fist so hard on the desk that the glass covering with all the papers pushed under it broke and she cut her meaty hand. Young lady, you are going directly to the psychiatrist. You are obviously a hostile, destructive personality needs supervision. What a way to talk to me when I'm trying to help you. You're farther gone than I thought. The noise attracted her secretaries and Dean Marn dialed the university hospital. I was escorted to the loony ward by two campus policemen. The nurse took my fingerprints. I suppose they run them under a microscope to see if there are any diseased bacteria on them. Then I was led to a bare room with a cot in it and stripped of all my clothing. I was put in a nifty gown that would have made even Marilyn Monroe look whipped. The door was shut and they turned the key. The fluorescent lights hurt my eyes and their humming was driving me as nuts as the treatment I had received. Hours later, Dr. Demiral, a Turkish psychiatrist, came in to talk to me. He asked me if I was disturbed. I told him I was sure that I was disturbed now and I wanted out of this place. He told me to call myself, and within a few days I'd be out. Until that time, I was being observed for my own good. It was a matter of procedure, nothing personal. Those next days, I beat out Betty Davis for acting awards. I was calm and cheerful. I pretended I was delighted to see Dr. Demiral's greasy, bearded face. We talked about my childhood, about Dean Marn, and about my simmering hatreds that I had repressed. It was very simple. Whatever they say, you look serious, attentive, and say yes, or I hadn't thought of that. I invented horrendous stories to ground my fury in the past. It's also very important to make up dreams. They love dreams. I used to lie awake nights thinking of dreams. It was exhausting. Within the week, I was released to return to the relative tranquility of Broward Hall. I stopped at my mailbox, which had two letters in it. One was written in Faye's handwriting one had a silver, blue, and gold edging around it, which meant it was from my beloved sisters at Tri-Delta. I opened that one first. It was official and had the crescent seal on the paper. I was dropped from the sorority, and they were sure I'd understand. Everyone hoped I'd get better. I ran up the stairs, opened the door, and found all Faye's things gone. I sat down on the lonesome bed and read Faye's letter. Dear sweet lover Molly, the resident counselor told me my father is coming to pick me up and I'm to pack everything. Daddy is apparently close to a heart attack over this whole thing because as soon as I got out of my disgusting discussion with the RC, I called home and Mums answered the phone. She sounded as though she had swallowed a razor blade. She said I'd better have an explanation for all this because Dad's ready to put me out in the funny farm to straighten me out. God, Molly, they're all crazy. My own parents want to lock me up. Mother was crying and said she'd get the best doctors there were for her little girl, and what did she do wrong? Vomit? I think we won't see each other. They'll keep me away, and you're locked up in the hospital. I feel like I'm underwater. I'd run away by myself, but I can't seem to move, and sounds roll in and out of my head like waves. I think I won't surface until I see you. It looks like I won't see you soon. If they put me away, maybe I'll never see you. Molly, get out of here. Get out and don't try to find me. There's no time for us now. Everything is stacked against us. Listen to me. I may be underwater, but I can see some things. Get out of here. Run. You're the stronger of the two of us. Go to a big city. It ought to be a little better there. Be free. I love you. Faye. P.S. Twenty dollars is all I had left in my account. It's in your top drawer with all the underpants. I left an old bottle of Jack Daniels there, too. Drink a toast to me and then fly away. Between a white pair of underpants and a red pair was the twenty dollars. Underneath the whole pile was the Jack Daniels. I drank Faye her toast, then walked down the hall with all the doors closing like clockwork and poured the rest of the bottle down the drain. The next day in my mailbox was a letter from a scholarship committee informing me that my scholarships could not be renewed for moral reasons although my academic record was superb. Nesting in the back of my closet with the palmetto books was my girl's state suitcase. I pulled it out and filled it, sat on it to close it. I left my books in my room except for my English book. 
left my turn papers and football programs in my last scrap of innocence. I closed the door forever on idealism and the essential goodness of human nature, and I walked to the Greyhound bus station by the same path that I had taken on my arrival. That was chapter 10. That was also the end of section 2. Next time, we'll get on to section 3. Well, this is an action-packed chapter. What do you think about what happens between Faye and Molly? Are you as sad as I am? I mean, for once, it seems like Molly met a girl who was actually into her and wasn't afraid to defend it. And then they get kicked out of school. I don't know. So tell me what you guys think about this chapter and what you think is going to happen now that Molly's really on her own. Do you think she's going to go back to her family? Do you think she's going to go to a big city like, I don't know, Charleston, South Carolina or something? Atlanta, something that's nearby Florida. So let me know what you think about this. And thanks for listening. I hope that you're enjoying the story so far. We're actually about halfway done with the book. So thanks.